I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome back to Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. It is the 14th of January, 2021. It's time for Year in Review on the year 2020 and what a year in film it was. What a weird, weird movie year it was. The weirdest movie year of my lifetime and probably one that will have a long-lasting effect on the industry as a whole because nobody knew what to do. Well, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you hold it back? Do you release it on streaming? What do you do with your movie that you spend all this money on? I think there was enough of a mix of both that it's going to be interesting like the next two to three years. I think there's enough movies that were held back that 2021, 20, 22, 23, you're just going to see stuff just get dumped. Yeah, we'll have a crowded summer, summer yeah. 2021. So what I usually do each year is I'll build a list of my top 10 films of the year. But I saw so few movies of 2020 that instead I simply ranked every movie that I saw that had a 2020 release date associated with it. And I'm going to work my way up that list from the bottom to the top, worst to best. And then anything that we don't catch uh, that Rob's seen and wants to talk about at the end, uh, we'll talk about that. So uh, my uh, there's 14 only 14 20, uh, 20 releases that I've seen. And the final two, I decided to... I list as a tie online, but obviously we'll, we, obviously we'll talk about them separately. And if I had to rank one as the lesser of the two, it's the one I'm going to start with. It's my number 14 movie of 2020, Wonder Woman 1984. That's ranking dead last for you, huh? Yeah, we had considered maybe doing a episode... I think we still will, it. but I was heavily sedated when I watched it the first time, okay. and so I need to rewatch it. It's a bad movie, and I want to do a recording on it, but I also kind of don't, because if there's one thing there's not a shortage of online, it's people taking apart Wonder Woman 1984. <laughs> I've listened to parts of a bunch of them, and it just doesn't work. Maybe we'll leave that one alone then. All right, so... We'll leave that a little... Well, I, I should say a couple couple things about it, just in well, brief I mean, outline. in terms of us. Oh, in terms of us doing an episode yeah. of it. Okay. Well, this is what I thought in... And again, you could go off in length about this movie, but I thought that the beginning of it, I kind of liked. I liked that it had a goofy 80s plot with the magic wishing stone. I liked the, the stick of Kristen Wiig, this awkward nerdy girl turned hot girl, which is just so horribly 80s. And I liked the villain. I liked that he was just uh, a guy that wanted to make a lot of money and he wasn't like out for revenge or to take over the world. Mm -hmm. I liked all that. And then it just decided, oh, we can't do something quirky and low scale. We have to just go crazy big. And it just stops holding up. Not that it ever held up in terms of logic that well, but it just goes so big that it, it, it drowns itself. It just... It, gets completely off the rails and starts to be really off-putting. Like, I was kind of angry at the movie for the last half or so of the movie because it didn't have to be that way. It's bad. It's the worst movie of the year. Out of what you remember from your haze, do you have anything to say about Wonder Woman 1984? There was parts of it that I liked, like you were saying, like the beginning. I felt like they didn't build the stakes consistently across the movie. It was a very and there was a couple things that seemed to me like they weren't fully explained. Oh. Uh, but again, I was relatively sedated. I was just looking at the director of it, Patty Jenkins, and I was trying to look at her filmography and what she's directed. And besides the original Wonder Woman, I'm not seeing a lot that stands out to me other than the Netflix show The Killing. Okay. which also was a little bit uneven. Mm. But it seems like she's done a lot of TV work outside of that. So, yeah. I'd heard it commented, you know, because the the previous Wonder Woman from 2017 is a solid movie. Yeah. And she did a solid job of directing that movie, but she didn't write it. She had her hand in writing this one. And just because you can direct a fine movie doesn't mean you can write a fine movie. And well, this movie was a mess in the writer's room. The other thought that stood out to me, and I mentioned it to you, in our previous conversation about this was it felt to me like it was re-edited in all of that downtime mm -hmm. and that there was a scene kind of reinserted or inserted at the end or recreated the six the months end. later Christmas and scene. And I, it felt so incongruous to me. I wasn't sure I appreciated that. And I'm not sure if that was a re-edit or if that was originally there. Yeah, and I don't either. It's, it's hard to place. 
but it's a bad, bad movie. And uh, the only thing that really approaches it is the other uh, superhero release that I saw this year, which is The New Mutants. Okay. That is uh, about a bunch of mutants, ethnically diverse from all over the world, that are gathered in a facility in a former Catholic school for testing. And it's kind of claustrophobic, small scale. And it was going for something different. And it is different, but it didn't really work and it feels like they're setting up these characters for something to come later like it's an origin movie but we're never going to see these people again and it it is completely unclear as to where this takes place in the horribly messed up timeline of the fox x-men movies Mm -hmm. so i have no idea when this is supposed to be the cast has macy williams from game of thrones okay it's got anna taylor joy in it and alisa burga as the uh, the lady who's running the facility, and it has I forget the name of some of the other cast members. There's a, a an Indian, an American Indian girl who, uh, who's the lead. Uh, I quite liked her, and then it's got one of the kids from Stranger Things, and then some other guy to round out the group of mutants. And nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And in the end, they fight a giant bear, like a giant dream bear. A giant. Dream? A giant ge- dream bear. Yeah. Because one of the mutants has powers relating to dreams. Okay. And her fear is a bear, because she's an Indian girl and her father was killed by a bear. So okay. a giant bear has to come at the end. It's almost like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I was thinking of. I was at least make it like a stuffed like animal so you could t- actually could turn it into the Stay Puft Marshmallow uh, Man. But, yeah. It's, it's not good. So that's number 13. Number 12. We've already done an episode about Greyhound. I like that more than you. I thought it was flat. I would, you know, glancing at the movies that I did see in 2020. Well, we're going to get I probably get to would put that right around number five or number six. Number five. Okay, me. so that's one of your favorite films of the year. Yeah. Well, I only saw like 10 movies this year, so it's not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, number 11, Jasper Ball, which is a film that you can watch for free right now on Amazon Prime. It's a documentary about a dying mall in Jasper, Alabama, and about the people that work there. And like the old people that hang out there and talk, and the manager's Australian, who and he used to run a zoo. And they meet this. There's this interracial couple of high school kids, and they they're kind of neat. And it's just a neat little slice of life documentary. I love the dead mall videos that you can find online. I just think that's fascinating. And this guy that runs the mall, he's basically everybody. He even like locks up the place at night and like cleans it. He's just trying to keep this little mall alive. Wow. Uh, and it's quaint. Number 10. We've also done an episode on Christmas Chronicles 2. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah. Not I, as good as Christmas Chronicles 1, but it's still pretty good. It was good. I did appreciate the inclusion of Goldie Hawn. Yeah. But again, not not any higher on my list than it is on yours. Number 9. Borat 2. Oh, I didn't include that on mine, yeah. What did you think of Borat 2? It was interesting. I haven't seen the first one. I think it probably helps to see the first one. So Even you're though, the one that told me it didn't matter. Well, you're you. right, you're right. Yeah. But maybe I should rephrase that as you'll appreciate two more if you've seen the first one because you see that it has much more, it has a stronger narrative and a stronger arcs and there's more of a heart to it, more of a point to it. I saw the first one like a couple days before I saw the sequel. And of course, the first one was filmed in like 2005, 2006. And so it very much captures America at that time. And boy, is there no better encapsulation of 2020 in film, to my knowledge, than Borat 2. Yeah. It gets it, gets it all. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I watched it in part for like some of the cultural references and some of the other things going on in that film or tangentially related to that film, you know, some of the Giuliani stuff, but yeah. there was not a lot to say about that film. I saw it, I can say I saw it. The girl, I think, is really good. She, like, she's surprisingly good. Yeah, she can act. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the way they had to put Sasha Baron Cohen as Borat in other costumes because everybody was recognizing him, and they're like, I can't do this as me. Yeah. And I do. I can't believe like some of those scenes that, that he gets away with. I you just can't imagine the how he gets song away with that. that he sings. I'm ta- thinking specifically of the uh, faxes of the. Oh yeah. Little 
shop that that's at. The guy that just yeah, he just keeps reading them and dictating the facts. He just and he, and he reads them straight. Like, okay, this is a fax from the leader of a country saying he's going to kill you. Yeah, and I'll just read it to you with basically no emotion. Yeah, uh, I I liked it. Again, made my top ten. Yeah, Greyhound should have been in your top ten. Number eight, Horse Girl. You should watch Horse Girl. This is a film that was made for Netflix. It stars Alison Brie, and it is a kind of a character study that slams into a science fiction movie. And Alison Brie plays this, this, this lady who's probably supposed to be in her early 30s, and she's very quiet and shy, and she works in a quilt store, a quilt and fabric store, and she starts having these weird missing time experiences. And it starts to freak out the people that are around her, including her co-workers. She's got a roommate. And I just I just was really impressed with it. It was such an unusual thing. And I feel like I've known people like this woman before. And I like how it gradually reveals the layers, kind of explaining things. Like you meet her stepfather. You find out a bit about her mother who's, di- who's died. And then she's got this obsession with this horse that she used to ride when she was younger, and she goes to visit the horse, and the people that maintain the stables are kind of like, we can't, we can't kick you out, or we're not going to kick you out, but we're not happy that you keep showing up to, to see the horse. And something that happened with her and somebody that she rode the horses with, and you eventually, eventually find out what happened to her, and it's just like this, this great character study that would have been fun on its own, and then it enters really weird... Stranger Things type territory at the end, but I I, I liked it. It was just a, an interesting choice, and I think Allison Brie is a fine young actress, and I it was just something really different that I enjoyed. And huh. we should see it. Number seven, uh, John Lewis, Good Trouble. This is a documentary about the Congressman John Lewis who died oh, yeah. like a couple weeks after it was released. Impressive man. It was really neat to to learn about him, and and one of the things I enjoyed is how everywhere he would go, people would stop him and want to talk to him. And he only had one child, and they interview his son in, in the film, and the, the crew, of course, have been following his dad around and seeing that he's constantly stopped. And, he'll, and he takes time to talk to everybody who stops to talk to him. And so the crew asked John Lewis' his son, it's like, well, what's, what's that like going someplace with your father? You know, everybody stops. It's, oh, yeah, we have to go so early to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> So number six uh, is this the other documentary on the list, The Dissident. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be said, watching that probably this next weekend. Yeah, so that's a documentary about... Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah, and his murder. It's done by the guy... Brian Fogel. Who did... Icarus. I will say a... And then you'll say another... Sandwiches? <laughs> fill in the gap thing we had going here until you ruined it. <laughs> Uh, but it's good. It's it's not as good as Icarus. Icarus is lightning in a bottle. You can't replicate that. Yeah. But it's a really good overview. I uh, take pleasure in all the fact that I'm the one that introduced you to Brian Fogel. Yeah. Yeah. And another interesting thing about this film, you can, I guess you can rent it, and they tried to get some kind of a streaming deal, but they couldn't yeah. because nobody wanted to step on the side of toes. So when I looked at it last weekend, it is twenty dollars to rent or twenty five dollars to buy. Oh wow! So I'm probably just going to purchase it this weekend. Yeah, might as well. Yeah. Number five, Soul. Yeah. We did an episode on Soul. I like Soul. Yeah, Soul was good. I don't know exactly where because I just barely. Uh, to clarify, I've been sedated for weeks because of a back injury, uh, so I haven't sat down and created my list, you know, yet. But so I wrote down a bunch of movies I'd seen this year. Not positive exactly where Soul would fall on my list, but it will be in the top five for sure. Hmm. So probably right around that four or five range. Four or five. Number four, Tenet. Uh, I still need to see that. Yeah. Tenet was the first movie I saw theatrically uh, that's 2020 release. The last, the last new film I'd seen in the theater before it was Parasite, like the day before the Oscars. And then I went and saw Jojo Rabbit a second time in the theater with my sister the first week of March when I went up to Boise. And I didn't see anything until like late August when yeah. I saw Tenet. Tenet's a good movie. I, I, had, I had intended to see that. I had a whole bunch of movies that were coming out early in the year that I wanted to watch you know, a little bit later, like Dollar Theater or something. My wife and I did an Oscars movies pass in early February. 
And then we were staying at home for a couple weekends because our dog was sick and, and eventually we passed away. Mm. And then COVID hit. Yeah. So, yeah. It kind of put me in a sour mood for 2020 films for a little while. Yeah. So. I did win a bet with myself about the movie Tenet. Yeah. When I sat in August, I'm like, this will still be in first run theaters in January. And it is. Well, I tried, again, that's another one I tried to rent the other day. Mm-hmm. You can purchase it right now, but you can't rent it. Mm-hmm. So, It's good. Uh, I don't think it's as good as a lot of the other films by... Christopher Nolan. Yes. But it's got some really interesting visual quirks to it. I definitely want to, to, to see it again because like a lot of Christopher Nolan films, there's a puzzle element to it. I want to see how well it fits together. And the way it messes with time, it's about backwards, the ability to flow backwards through time and like things that are like polarized to, to go through time reversed. I forget they use a term for it in the film. And I'm guessing it, it works when, you, when held up to scrutiny because Nolan is pretty, seems like he's a stickler for that kind of thing. But you, it, when you watch it, you're like, what? And is, is that, how would that work? But anyway, it's, it's a clever idea. It's good. Denzel Washington's son is in it, and he's good. And Elizabeth Deblicki De is in it, and she's good. She's also, like, super tall. Yeah. She's like six foot three, six foot four. Much taller than the leading man. But yeah, it's different. It's definitely one that I need to revisit. Number three, The Godfather Coda, which is a re-edit of 1990's The Godfather Part Three. Yeah, I also haven't seen that one yet. I've seen The Godfather Part 3 once. I saw it in a Clean Flix edited VHS copy in 2003. <laughs> I remembered very little of it. One, like the scene that I remember the most was Sofia Coppola cooking with Jerry Garcia. Or John Garcia, Gar- whatever Garcia. Yeah. I remember that scene and a couple other things. And I remember the end because I really like the end. And they change the end in this film and they make it a little more ambiguous, which I didn't like as much. But... The Godfather Part Three has a reputation as being the the sickly the sickly sibling, mm-hmm. not very good, and it's not on the level of the original Godfather, the Godfather Part Two. But I think it's better than than a lot of people make it out to be. And uh, again, it's been so long since I've seen an actual seen the actual original Godfather Part Three that it's kind of hard for me to say in any detail about it, other than kind of these impressions that I retain from having watched it. But I thought the Godfather Coda really worked. Like, I thought it was quite strong. Again, not as strong as the first two, but uh, a worthy yeah. wrap-up. Number two, The Trial of Chicago 7. That's a good film. Aaron Sorkin. So you did finally see yep. it. I caught up with that, I want to say, last weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's very well done. Uh, very Sasha Oscar Baron bait. is very good in it. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, this has been in you know different levels of production for quite some time. I'm kind of curious why... It took till this year to get Well, to come Spielberg out. was originally uh, attached to direct, and yeah, he, he bowed actually out. asked Sorkin to write it mm-hmm. for him to direct, and then bowed out for I'm not sure the the some you kind know, of conflict. Yeah, what the, exactly the reasons? He's were. working on 1942. There you go. Yeah, uh, it's good. Uh, it's very solid. It's very satisfying. It's the kind of film that gets nominated for Oscars. It's the kind of film that. It feels like something I would have seen in like the early 90s. Like yeah. it's kind of surprising that this story wasn't made earlier, but I just can picture, you know, my parents renting it from Blockbuster and a 12-year-old me being super impressed. Yeah. And it is good. It, there, it's solid. There are a few inaccuracies in the uh-huh. movie or things that are taken out of context, things like that. But the vast majority of what's in this film is exactly how it happened. Yeah. A lot of the court dialogue you know, between like involving like the judge, that's exactly like from the transcripts. There's a documentary film called, I think it's called like The Trial of the Chicago 10, which uses, uh, you know, period footage, but it also has recreations of the courtroom scenes and they use computer animation. Like, uh, yeah, this is about 10 years old when, when this documentary came out. And they have celebrity voices. And it's like that documentary is an audition. It's like saying, make me a big theatrical movie because there's a lot of really good scenes. Yeah. And so I'm glad that it finally happened. I'm glad that Aaron Sorkin didn't, did it because he's really the, the person to do it. Yeah. Like he's, th- this is right up his alley. Kind of uh, semi-syrupy, liberal, aspirational, feel-good drama. It's solid, but it really does not take risks. Yeah. 
unlike my favorite film of the year, number one is Mank. I started that, and I was having trouble getting into it the day that I started it. Mm-hmm. Again, I think part of that was a function of the medications. Yeah. So I've started it, but I, I, we weren't uh, following to... along sufficiently, so I stopped it. So this is a film. This is David Fincher adapting a screenplay that his late father wrote in the 1990s. The film version of, of that original project fell apart in pre-production in, like, 97. And then Fincher's dad passed away in 2003. I think he will win Best Original Screenplay at the Oscars. And he's been dead for like 17 years, 18 years. Hmm. So it'll be, I think, the longest posthumous Oscar like ever. Because we've had actors that win it like the same year that they die. But I don't think there's ever been a screenplay that has been put to film 25 years after it was written like this. Yeah. It's solid. It's about Herman Mankiewicz and the making of Citizen Kane. It also has subplots relating to the studios messing with California politics in the 1930s and uh, Mankiewicz's relationship with Marion Davies and William Randolph Hearst. Of course, Kane is modeled off of William Randolph Hearst. There's questions about the authenticity of a lot of things in this movie. This is based on the Pauline Kael thesis from the 70s that Wells was hardly involved at all in the writing, and that it was basically all Mankiewicz, which Mankiewicz asserts as true, but which apparently is no longer in vogue. Apparently it's been reassessed, and the, the consensus view is that Wells was more heavily involved in the writing of the film, or at least the rewriting of the film, than Mankiewicz or this movie puts forward. But it's a great performance uh, from John Mankiewicz and from the sporting characters, particularly Amanda Seyfried as Marion Davies. This film has just some great dialogue sequences, long dialogue sequences. One of my favorite is when they're at a party at the Hearst residence and this big group, including Louis B. Mayer and several directors and other prominent people in Hollywood are having a discussion basically about do we keep our films in the German market now that Hitler's in charge? And their consensus is it would be crazy to cut off such a lucrative market. And, you know, this Hitler's never going to really do anything anyway. (laughs) But there's a lot of great scenes with this. The dialogue is, is just stupendous. And so somebody wrote a film with better dialogue than Aaron Sorkin. That's that's an accomplishment. Yeah, that is an accomplishment. I, there's a, one in particular that you didn't include on your list mm-hmm. that I'm curious as to why All right. that I know you've seen, mm-hmm. which was, I, I'm going to say, is my number one of the year, mm-hmm. Hamilton. Yeah. I uh, You know what? What is Hamilton? It is a film release of a... It's not really a movie. Production. production. It's not really a movie. It's yeah. a, it's a, it's a the filming of a theatrical production. And you're right. I, if if I were, I'd probably get probably get number one. Yeah. Uh, just as a viewing experience this year, you know, I uh, recently got a tablet and I've got Disney Plus on the tablet, and I'm like, I'll probably break it up, and watch it maybe over a day or two. I watched that whole three it's freaking hour thing in one sitting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it was has such momentum to it. Yeah, and yeah. I need I need to revisit it soon. Uh, yeah. I I adored it. I, I I'm a late comer, late comer to this bandwagon. But I heard a very unique thing about it that I actually kind of want to try at some point. It's also extremely cheesy, mm-hmm. which is Hamilton was intended to be seen in the theaters, and it's treated like it's a theater experience even at home. And I know of multiple people that dressed up. And went and sat down to watch Hamilton like they were dressed up like they were going mm-hmm. to the theater. And sit, sit down and have the theater experience. And when they had the intermission, they hit pause and had like snacks and chatted and, and things. And then went back for the second half. So part of me is intrigued and curious and would like to do that. And part of me is like, well, that's cheesy. I could watch it in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> so other ones that I will mention that I saw that Nate hasn't uh, seen yet. Extraction, the Netflix release uh, starring Chris Hemsworth. You should add that to your list. What, and what's, you should... what's Extraction? Extraction is... Let me look up the synopsis so that I can do it properly. I'm not saying that Nate would like this movie. I'm just saying you should see it. No, 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 no. I'm suspicious of that. I've got a digression. It's, a, it's an action film, but Chris Hemworth is, is Tyler Rake, and Tyler Rake is a black market mercenary 
who is conducting an extraction of someone, and it's the worst of his career, and it has a controversial ending, and they're making a sequel hmm. that flies in the face of the controversial ending. Indeed. So. so I said I had a little digression. Uh-huh. So I had a friend of mine, a good friend, who was in the military. This is 2005, 2006, something like that. And he's going to Virginia for something. I'm like, oh, you're going to Virginia. When you're in Virginia, you got to eat at Waffle House. I go, okay. So no, you must eat at Waffle House. So I hear back from him afterwards. Oh, I had a Waffle House. It wasn't very good. I didn't say it was good. I just said you had to eat there. Because <laughs> that's like a total Southern experience. Yeah. So, is this Waffle House? Are you telling me to go to Waffle House? Kind of, but no. Mm. It, it's better than Waffle House, but only marginally. So, it's Shoney's. Shoney's is a little high class for this mm. one. <laughs> you don't have as much of the buffet. It is an action film. If you like action films, it's worth seeing. It's on Netflix. It's not that long. I guess it is. It's an hour and 56 minutes. But it was interesting. I don't regret having seen it. Unlike Wasp Network, which is also on Netflix. Wasp Network? Which... Um, like Wasp? No. L- like a bug or like a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant? Wasp Network. Wasp? has so, that spelled? Wasp. W-A-S-P. Wasp. Okay, yeah, yeah. Penelope Cruz, Ed- Edgar Ramirez, Gail Bernal, Anna de Armas. All right. Um, yeah. Anna de Armas. Which on IMDb is listed as a 2019 credit, but on the list I looked at on Wikipedia, it's listed as a 2020 credit. I didn't enjoy that. I watched the entire what series. What is it? Oh, this is a series, not a movie. It's Well, it's the story of five Cuban political prisoners who'd been imprisoned in the U.S. since ah. the 1990s. Hence, Anna de Almas. Yeah, charges of espionage and murder. It's not a long series, but yeah, it was... I didn't enjoy that one. Other honor, honorable mentions, and if they, if we were counting shows, would be higher on my list. Mandalorian, that okay. was good. And the other one that I really want Nate to see, it's a limited series on Netflix. Really enjoyed it. Fascinated, still fascinated with the show. Don't blink with cats. Yeah, you didn't tell me. I still me. want Nate, I gotta Nate to see, see these that. Blanking cats. But ones that I know I still need to see from 2020, Mulan, Bad Education, Tenet. Those are top three for me, pretty pretty close, in addition to The Dissident. But I also want to see The Call of the Wild, because I have HBO right now. Mm-hmm. And then the one that probably has gotten a little bit messed up for us, that neither one of us would have liked, and probably would have been pretty close to the bottom of our list, had we been able to see it. We actually have attempted to watch this, but it's... You can't rent the movie. What what what, what are we going to do? What bad, are we going to do? Bad Boys for Life. We've already watched the first two Bad Boys and have recorded the episodes, and they're sitting on my hard drive waiting to be released. But we wanted to release them with the three together, the and plan, we've never seen Bad Boys for Life. The plan was to, to rush... To see it in the dollar theater. Yeah, because so uh, he had shown me the original Bad Boys a few years ago, which I hated. Yeah. And then I'm like, you know what? I'll just watch Bad Boys 2, and then we'll go see Bad Boys 3 in the theater, and we'll have a trilogy. But we were waiting for the dollar, for theater. The dollar theater, and it was still in the first-run theaters when everything shut down in March. The dollar theaters are no more here. And we came very close to recording that episode the other day, but just uh, Rob could not bring himself to pay the $9 to buy the copy. I think it was more than $9, but... Uh-huh. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's the highest grossing movie this year. Uh, yeah, I was saying that, that you know, it was released in January in the dead zone, and it had no competition. And because of COVID, it had no competition at the top of the box office for the yeah. rest of the year. Yeah. Kind of a crazy year for films. We can only hope that 2020, I mean, 2020 is going to be better. It has to be, right? 2021. 2021. Yeah. Hindsight is 2020. Yeah. Well, we can hope so, but January started off, you know, trying to, with a hold my beer moment, so yeah, I'm not yeah, so sure, yeah. so we'll see. A stupid coup. Yeah, well, it wasn't a coup, it was a, it was an insurrection, mm-hmm. but if you look, by definition, it was not a coup. Oh, okay. So, I have a proposal that Nate knows nothing about, oh. I want to discuss with Nate. Oh. Those of you who have watched our channel, our channel artwork is a very old photo of the two of us. In fact, it's so old that I only have a goatee. And I've had a full beard for, what, 
almost since you've been down here, haven't mm-hmm. I? Something like that. But now, the, co- the year of COVID, Nate has not had a haircut nor shaved since... The first week of March. Yeah. And uh, we have talk- talked many a time about getting a caricature for our the picture on our podcast. Mm-hmm. I think we should get a bearded caricature. Okay. And before you, you cut your hair, we should get our caricature done, you know, as our legacy of 2020. Okay. That, that works. For those of you who don't know me personally, I always have a beard growing all the time because the only time you'll see me with a short beard is basically from Christmas to New Year's and the first two weeks of January because I don't trim my beard, I don't cut my beard from Christmas to Christmas because I bleach it and I portray Santa Claus. Mm. So I always have a big beard, but mine's especially big because I didn't cut it this year. No. So, yeah. I usually have a trimmed beard. Yeah. But I decided I went, I sh- basically shaved my head and I shaved my beard. And the the point was I was starting a work from home position, ironically, just as the COVID crap started, hit the yeah. fan. So I was like, this is my joke about working from home. And now everybody's working from home. And I just kind of been like, I can get away with this. I can look like a homeless person because I work at home. Yeah. <laughs> It's an, it's entertaining, and I'm kind of curious to see how the caricature would come out. Maybe we'd have a caricature produced, and we'd hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I, we need to find someone that does caricatures. Actually, there is someone who does. You can, like, send in pictures, and someone makes, like, a Simpsonized version. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should do that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, anything else to add? No, I think that's it. Okay, I'm Rob. I'm Nate. And this is Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. Need to tell you about the soda, or should you be surprised by what the soda flavor you is? You guide me. Well, I might really make you angry if I don't tell you what it is. I don't. I won't be that angry. I've been taking my medicine. No. <laughs> so you've been back to the root beer store then, huh? Yeah. So we ate at the GQ Kitchen, which is Greek stuff. GR Kitchen. GR Kitchen. I thought maybe we would go to Moochie's, where I get something that tastes like this in a sandwich form almost weekly. This is Buffalo Wing Soda. Oh, really? I can't say that it smells like Buffalo Wings. Is it branded? Oh, I wondered if it was like Frank's. Oh, that's another Lester's Fixin'. I don't think that tastes like Buffalo Wings. (laughs) I'm probably not finishing this one. You know, it's another one of those ones where you're drinking it. It's okay. And I kept drinking because I'm like, I know this is going to taste gross once I stop, once it becomes aftertaste. And that's exactly what happened. See, my problem with this is it doesn't taste what it... Like, I don't care if it tastes gross afterwards. I don't care if it burns afterwards. But it should at least taste like what it claims to be. Well, it definitely has... Buffalo wing aftertaste. Kind of light, kind of light, but I would say I definitely taste it. Yeah, I don't don't care for this one. It is 2020 as a beverage. I don't know. I think this is a little bit better than that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Only marginally. So this is 2019 as a beverage. (laughs) Okay. You going to buy that again? Absolutely not. You going to take some home to your family? No, I'm going to be putting this in the sink. I, the, what does that even smell like to you? It smells citrusy to me. Yeah, exactly. It smells nothing like buffalo wings or hot sauce or anything. Mm. All right. Well, that was that one.